Are you guys having a great December day? Well, for me, for the last two and a half years, every day's been December day. Um, hi, I'm Steve Lomacall. I'm a solution architect at Data Stacks. It's all right there. Um, I know you've been talking a whole lot about Cassandra, but I'm going to give you a little more. We're going to push a little bit beyond the limits of Cassandra. So the goal, the goal of today's conversation, we love Cassandra, at least I do. Are the feelings mutual? Okay, well maybe by the end of the day we will. But of course we're an enterprise. I mean, an enterprise. So you may need, you may need to, um, you know, you may demand more than what an open source, a cool open source database project can do, because you're used to Oracle, you're used to DB2. Anybody used to DB2? So you're going to have, so you have enterprise problems, and DataStax Enterprise offers enterprise solutions. So you demand performance, and DataStax Enterprise is tested. Uptime, that's why you're here, that's why you want Cassandra. But you need to keep this thing under control. And if you build your stack using a whole bunch of other cool enterprise products cobbled on top of Cassandra, that's going to be a, a challenge. So that's where DataStax Enterprise comes in. Security. I guess, you know, we've had some customers here who have been on Cassandra for years. Most of those customers are other high-tech companies, right? Because it was sort of like a partial solution. Well, now we're moving into banks, we're moving into insurance companies, we're moving into Main Street, and this is, and healthcare. That's about most importance. Right? Every, every beat on the news, you hear about a security problem. And the Blue Cross was the latest. Like I said, healthcare. Compliance is a big issue. So even if you have your cluster behind an app server farm, Compliance might require that your data is secure independently of the application. So how can we help? Well, of course we have Cassandra. Your stack may require a search. Security, those are like your credit card numbers flying on your computer. And I've been working with the graphic designer. I'm the graphic designer. As you can tell, I've gone to computer science school, I've never been to art in college. Uh, analytics, so some of you have been talking about Spark today. We'll talk a little bit about Spark in the context of security, but um, there are other Spark heads around here who are much better at it than I am. And of course, in memory. And why that's important is very often your cool application needs these pieces. But if there are a whole bunch of other products all working together, and they do, managing it becomes a huge challenge. So we bring it together in one box. So you can manage a single data platform. So we know Cassandra has very fast OLTP capabilities. Basically, why search, right? Queries are very targeted and also vulnerable. So let's talk about data in Cassandra, and then we'll talk about where we fit in, where search fits into it, and then afterwards we'll talk a little bit about security. So you'll set up a cluster, and that's great. Um, I've had people set up DataStacks Enterprise, and then they, then they say, now what? Well, they've got to put some things in DataStacks Enterprise. So you'll probably create a key space, in your key space, you're going to create tables. Tables will have rows. So there's different levels uh, of objects that you may need to search and uh, secure. So my schema, what's a key space? Uh, if you've 
If you're familiar with Cassandra or you went to any of the um, sort of more elementary talks, you might be familiar with a create key space statement. It's just a container for your data. Uh, it's almost like an Oracle schema. The only difference is the key space also controls your replication, which is a little bit different um, than relational databases. That's fine. Um, where we differ is the table. It's all about the key. What Patrick said earlier, it's all about the schema, but, or it's all about the data model, but it's all about the key. Queries in Cassandra have to be through the key. And we do offer secondary indexes that let you key other things, but they're only going to get you so far. So in this example, um, there's an example of a table, books by publisher. Uh, and the key is four parts. And you'll say, well, just a minute. I, I see the key. It's got publisher, author, year, and an ISBN number. And we know ISBN is unique. So, that, so why don't I just make my primary key ISBN and it'll all work? Well, it will, except they won't be able to find it. So in Cassandra, you know, you'll define a key. So here I have a publisher uh, as my partition key, and then author year and ISBN is my, what I call, clustering columns. And that lets me do some queries. So I can search by publisher. I can search by publisher and author. Search by publisher, author, and year, or even order by year. That's all okay. But um, it, it's only going to get you so far. So, for example, if I had, here's the primary key again, I put it on top just so you're reminded of it. If I wanted to select from books, I can do this. I can say select from books where publisher is O'Reilly. No problem. But if I wanted to search O'Reilly's books that are newer than 2005, forget about it. We don't go there. We don't do that. Now, of course, I can say publisher, author, and publication date. That's because that's the order of the key. That will work. So that's great, and that's really fast. But sometimes you need more. So we have Solar Search built on top of Cassandra. It'll create free text indexing. I mean, what can you do? Well, so, you know, back here. Back here. Forget about like queries. Forget about substrings. Now, of course, a relational database does these things, but at a huge cost, right? It'll scan your tables, it'll Parallel scan your tables, it'll take a half an hour, but it'll do what it takes to get the answer. What we've done is we've integrated Solar Search. So you get free text indexing, you can index just the words in a field, you can index whole fields, you could shred the fields the way you'd like. So maybe you want to lowercase them, maybe you want to get rid of the punctuation. It does all of that for you. And it's used today in a lot of applications. The only challenge is managing it separately from the main data store. Um, you can perform ad hoc queries. Cassandra is really fast at your OLTP workload, but ad hoc queries, that's, um, that's a difficult area. So Solar lets you do some. Spark lets you do additional types of ad hoc queries. Solar will do the ones that Solar Index can handle. The other ones that require sort of more of a scanning pattern MapReduce. Map is just a scan. Uh, use Spark for that. Um, the, the big challenge with Solar itself is distributing it. Cassandra is amazing at distributing data, sharding data, and replicating data. Solar, um, Apache Solar not so much. Our integration takes care of all of that for you. Uh, you can do something called a group by query. Solar doesn't call it call it that though. They call it faceting, but it's there. Well, they're having more fun in this store. And this is the thing that, you know, we have to caution you of. You can break a few rules. We have all these query rules in Cassandra. You get to break some with Solar. Now, what I don't want to see, what's an anti-power, 
is using solar for everything because you have a relational application. Cassandra doesn't let you do everything the way you were doing it before. I guarantee you, you can do everything. And often you can do it better. But you can't do it the same way. So an Andrew pattern is just use solar as a relation as, as a replacement for your typical relational workbook. So how does it work? Well, we have the key space and table. That's why I, I gave you those nice circles before. I left the other bits out for now. So in Cassandra, we call it a key space with a table. So fully qualified table. Solar, we call it a solar core. Defined differently. So in Cassandra, they'll do create table. In solar, typically you'll post, they'll, they'll create a solar configuration and post it. So you're almost creating a parallel schema. If that's too much, we'll build a simple schema for your data with a tool called DSE tool built into DataStax Enterprise. But if you want to get the cool features out of solar, you're going to want to be setting up these files. So I have like a real example, a real live demo. So schema.xml. Um, you can define how you want to treat different fields. So this is just an example. Saying I want a field, I made up the name of the field type myself, I'm going to call it text. But I thought of that all by myself. Uh, I'm using the solar standard tokenizer factor, which I couldn't tell you what it does exactly, but it kind of removes punctuation in most cases. It depends if the punctuation has a space or whatever. Um, and pulls out other bits and bobs from the text. I may want to use the stop word factory, like remove the and of. I didn't in this case. Uh, and then I want to lowercase it. Because, you know, you have words, let's say, McCracken, you have an extra capital C in the middle. I don't want to worry about that. And I can just build a parallel schema. So this is the same schema as uh, the data I showed you, other than I changed the thing to year, because it's shorter, it fits on the slide better. So I have all of the fields that I'm interested in um, indexing. Uh, I'm stating I want to index and store. I, I don't want to, I'm not going to go into the details of stored. If you're interested, come bug me afterwards. And um, I also need to state the unique key. That way Solar can find the records, so I stated my key. By the way, so in Cassandra, if you have a fancy key with extra it with extra brackets and stuff. You don't need to do that here. You just include all the columns in, in one level of brackets. The other difference is uh, your application, when it accesses Cassandra, you're going to typically go through our Java driver. Okay, a few people may be using Thrift, but typically our Java driver. If you want to go and query Solar, you may go natively against the solar core, it offers a web service interface. So as soon as you uh, activate solar on your nodes, you've got web services on every single node. You can query those and, and run solar queries directly. So you can have an application that's a hybrid. Um, so for example, when you get data back, you'll typically get back JSON or XML format for your data. That's configurable. Actually, it's configurable on the recorder, which is nice. The trade-offs? Solar is not real-time. People try to tell you it is, and it's close. And it can update pretty quickly. But when you, if you update data in Cassandra, our secondary index manager queues up the modifications and will, and Solar will, index them subsequently. And then even when it does index them, the indexes are not necessarily online, by the way. It could be a second, it could be 10 seconds, or it could be a few milliseconds, depending on how you configure solar. But typically you're not going to want it in real time. It might be faster if you insert the data through solar. It has a web service interface. One feature is you can post documents to it. When you post documents to solar, 
uh, it will automatically index it uh, as well as insert it into the Cassandra row. Uh, Solar has not been compatible with vNodes. Things keep changing. vNodes make it really easy for you to manage your cluster, especially if you want to grow it or replace nodes and things like that. But um, Solar has some compatibility issues. Um, you're double writing your data because you get a side index. The queries will go to all nodes and then get deduped. And what's special about us is the solar index will index the data on that node. So if you have a replication factor of three, you'll have three copies of the data in solar indexes around your cluster. When you query them, you'll get three results. Then those get filtered out. Uh, we, we automatically send the right predicates to make sure that we also include uh, that we don't duplicate data, but it's more complex. It creates heat pressure. Sometimes Cassandra has enough heat pressure as it is. When you add solar and it's sharing the same JVM, it's tricky. Solar also has a habit of gobbling up heat, so you got to be careful. You got to be careful with it. And now for the part of your application people hate dealing with, other than the security consultants in the room. How many people are concerned with security consultants? Okay, a couple. That's good. How many people need to secure your cluster? <laughs> Not sure. Okay. How many people just want to learn to draw like I do? Good. Good, I can show you. I have an eye. I'm going to sign it. When I sign it, then I can do that. Uh, okay, this is a boilerplate slide I just took from somewhere. Uh, secured in Cassandra, we have authentication and object permissions, I'll show you that. We have client-to-node encryption, and I think node-to-node encryption is missing there. Datastax Enterprise adds a whole lot. Um, you have external authentication, such as LDAP and Kerberos. If you want to make a lot of money, you can learn to set up Kerberos. It's not easy, but it is, when it's working, it's really cool, but it's not easy to set up. Oh, I have six minutes, okay. Um, we have uh, data encryption. We have data auditing and a few other features. We also have security for the other components of Datastax Enterprise. So how do I keep it all secure? Well, let's see the touch points. Client to know is the Yellow connection, uh, node to node, so you can secure the gossip connections between the nodes. Um, your address data, you can encrypt it, uh, <clears throat> uh, except for the commit log. <laughs> yeah, it's um, we don't currently encrypt the commit log. Another place we actually store data is a, is in a directory called Save Caches. Cassandra loves to cache stuff. And we love to bounce our nodes, and everything's always on. And when we bounce a node, we don't want the performance to suck. So we, we persist our caches every so often. So a node will start up with safe caches. But who knows what's in those caches? So we do have something coming that will also encrypt everything we put on disk. We also have object permissions. And sometimes those are really important. And the good news is those are really easy. They're really important sometimes to protect you from yourselves. How easy is it to log into a cluster and accidentally drop or something or you're logged into the wrong cluster? So by consciously logging in with the right account, that can at least protect you from yourself and make sure you've got an account with the right permissions if you intend to drop an object or modify a schema. Um, what about search and analytics? How do we secure those? Apply it to solar. We will do that, and I did that. Spark security. Um, I'm going to use a line from Facebook. It's complicated. It's a Facebook status. Um, address data. Uh, well, no. Um, so besides our our other data files, you'll get a solar index. It sits in your data directory. That does not get encrypted. Uh, object permissions. Again, there's some limitations with Spark and Solar. For example, you're going to honor the object permission 
in the Cassandra circles when solar goes after that, but not the stuff that's in the solar index, which might be everything. So client to node, just to show you a little bit about what to do, edit your Cassandra YAML file and create a key store file. Well, create a key store, there's instructions on doing that. Turn it on and you're done. Uh, you can also set up a thing called a trust store. I'm not an SSL expert, so I couldn't exactly tell you what the added benefit is, but when Solar talks to Cassandra, it needs to use that trust store, so set that up too in those instructions. And voila, well, you're, you're uh, secure. And I did all that, and it didn't quite work, right? I couldn't connect CQLSH. I really secured my cluster, but... Um, uh, <laughs> so it turned out there were some instructions that were wrong. So for CQLSH, um, there's uh, some settings in the CQLSHRC file that are different than what's in our documentation. So when you get a copy of this presentation, it's here. I got it off a blog post. Rachel, who's in the lobby, uh, dug it out for me, so I'm thankful that um, this did the trick. Um, node to node encryption, it's very similar to client to node, set a key store, trust store, and it just works automatically. Nodes know how to talk to each other, whereas an application might not. Um, user authentication, nice feature. Um, you'll choose an authentication method in your Cassandra YAML. And by the way, I keep saying Cassandra YAML, but how many of those YAML files do you have? One per node, so make sure that if you change something that you change it everywhere, or use Hop Center. You have a choice of three authenticators, and the fourth one is the default, it's called the Allow All Authenticator. It does what it says. <laughs> so, pick one that you like. I picked LDAP in this case, and then I left it in my YAML file, and couldn't figure out why I couldn't use my cluster. Uh, and then you need to pick an authorizer, and this is the only one we offer, the Cassandra authorizer, or there's the allow all. And by doing that, that will enable grant, revoke, and you have all the usual permissions, select, modify, because we all know we don't read before we write, so we don't know the difference between delete and update and insert. They're all the same, so we just call that modify. And there's a few others, alter table, create key space, one that lets you grant permissions to other people. You could do it on a key space and table level, so that's really handy. Uh, at rest data encryption. We just treat it like a compression algorithm. So you can just change it on a table by table basis. You may not need to encrypt everything. Um, besides encryptor, we have like a snappy encryptor, which will both compress and encrypt, and we have a deflate version, and because the parameter is a little JSON-style thing, you get to pick other options to go with it. And that's great. It encrypts the SS tables on write. Um, commit log save caches to come. Um, you may want to consider something like Vormetric. The Vormetric folks are here today, so they can encrypt everything on your platter. Very handy. Um, oh, commit log. Ah, I gotta get rid of commit log. Uh, and then what are the trade-offs? Obviously your whole stack has many other pieces, so sometimes you need to consider how to secure all the pieces of your application. Right? Vulnerabilities are complicated. But the, the beauty of open source software is it lets you do so many things so easily, yet these are the vulnerabilities. Uh, each component has its own nuances. So I wish I could say all the components work well together. This is the last slide. All right. All right. We started a minute late. We didn't have any quorum when I was right at 320. That's a bad Cassandra joke. Um, Spark as well. Like I said, it's complicated. And then you have processing overhead. 
Uh, for a lot of customers, when you're behind an app server, that's often adequate, so think about it that way. So thank you. Unfortunately, uh, we're out of time for questions, but I'll be in the back, and I'll be around for a while. <laughs>